Lucky Lefty Podcast. I know our boys in the building. SDD2 Mike's left himself brought to you by Nora Whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com, that premium American whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. And if you drink, by all means, make sure you do so. Responsibly. You got to do it responsibly, man. See a beat nation. Also check us out on Patreon, Patreon.com forward slash Lefty Lefty Network. Apple Podcast, Spotify for your audio edibles each and every day. And then subscribe to us on YouTube. We greatly appreciate it. We'll actually be up on Twitch starting next week, bro. Oh, yes. Live streaming. Live streaming as well. So we're going to bring that into the family. So check in with us. We are the home of the misguided passion. And we are forever committed to making sure that we continue to do what left? Spin it different. Yeah, yeah. So how was your... uh? Your day, love. I have something funny. It's 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 funny. I want to. I want to. You know, man. Look, <laughs> it's a poor frog that wants to celebrate his own pond, dude. Oh, you know what I mean? Okay, okay. I so like that. that's coming up. That yeah, something that we'll get to in a minute. But how was your Wednesday? And happy opening day. Unofficially, opening day was last week. You know, with the Dodgers and Padres. For all of you locally in the States, happy MLB opening day. Mm. I'm still debating whether or not I'm going to put myself through the suffering of actually watching the White Sox today at 3 o'clock. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm in a good mood. Illinois plays tonight. I don't even want to mess my mood up. Right. But I'm, it's opening day. I'm a baseball fan. So, left, I have to decide whether or not I'm going to put myself through that. No, no you know, bad energy. No bad yeah. energy. Yeah, I, I don't know if I want to do that, love. I don't know if I want to do that. That's right. Look, opening day, you know, your team might come out with some some fire because it's the start of the year. Everybody's coming out of training camp. This is like the uh, your, your peak performance right now because after that, it goes downhill. It's definitely going downhill with this squad, bro. But <laughs> you, I mean, you're out there with a squad that almost won the World Series, bro, out there in the AZ. Yeah, the Diamondbacks, yeah, them, them boys, uh, they always have a solid team, especially I think the indoor helps. You know, just the indoor facility they have. Really, yeah. nice. uh, it's popping, man. The Arizona sports is popping. The Suns is decent. Uh, the, the Mercury is always decent. You know, the Diamondbacks do their thing. So, Yo, that, the Suns uh, beat the Nuggets last night again at Denver. At Denver, yeah, that's yeah. right. KD's still that man. I don't know why people just forget that. K- they just think he's just. They act like he's uh somehow, some way he's gone. Yeah, like what? He's hated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is amazing. It is amazing. On today's show, we're definitely going to talk offense. Mike Denbrock, Elon McCullough, running back. We'll talk Denbrock, McCullough, and then we'll get to the individual running backs and what they had to say. And there's a lot of diversity within this offense that we can already see. And we're not even halfway through the spring. We're just getting to that halfway point. But left going back to, look, thought about it. Then I said, you know what? No, because I told you, left, that my baby girl Mm. was blessed and selected by the NCAA Women's uh, Basketball Tournament to sing the national anthem left. And, uh, yo, you're darn right. You're darn right I'm going to pub my baby uh, on my podcast. You're darn right. This, right. Is, this is Ari Camille. Yeah.
That's right. That's right. That's right. It's yeah. always over my shoulder. You hear me? Bro, That's right. Proud moment, bro. That's a lot of days sitting outside of voice lessons, a lot of days sitting outside of piano lessons, my brother. You know what okay. I mean? Okay. Uh, yeah. You was in the you was in the gym shooting with her. When she was getting right. Driving 30 minutes, driving an hour to the north side of Chicago when she got to one of the top music schools right after class. She had to be there at four. She got out at three. Man, punk, hustle, fighting through yeah. traffic on the north side. Yeah. Tell you some people, when it comes to your kids, no investment is ever a bad investment. I'm just letting Man. you know. Man. No, no. Give them every resource and tool that you can give to them. Absolutely. Yo, and that's really cool to see the work pay off. Man, it's never it's never a, a short thing. It always comes over time, and when it does, you just feel that rush of emotion because you remember, you remember how hard it was getting place to place and doing all of that, man. So to tee it up like that on on, on the podcast is just it's good to see. Good, to man. See. Absolutely. You know, I thought about. I said, I'm like, I said, you darn right. It's my podcast. You darn right. That's right. You're darn right. I'm a pub. My door. She has two songs on iTunes, Ari Camille. Who? She has two joints. She's working on her EP right now. She told me she found a local local producer out there. She feels like she's caught a vibe with. Because she recorded. Now, this is, I, did I tell you this story? She recorded a year ago this time. She came home for spring break, recorded an EP, four songs. Four songs? I paid for the studio time, Left. Mm. He was supposed to release it in August. Oh, we he, talked about that. He calls me and tells me, nah, I don't like it. Mm. Now, see, this is that artist side I don't understand. All I'm looking at is the fact that I didn't pay for four days of studio time left. That's, That's right. all I'm looking yeah. for. I'm like, yeah. wait a minute, hold on. Like, you gonna put this junk out. I don't care if it's on yeah, SoundCloud. Yeah, yeah, you gonna put this to out. Shelf out. This money. This money gonna have to be used right. now. Right. You, you trying to shelve you? the money? You right. Money? I'm like, what do you mean you're not putting it out? You, yeah, this ain't practice. Money. This ain't you practice. You almost had a Joe Jackson moment. This ain't practice. We we doing this for real. <laughs> Man, I was heated, dude. When I said I was heated, left, and I had to respect her artistry, dude. I had to. I had to. Whatever it was that she heard. She was like, nah. Said, yeah, you know, they they super critical. They, they do something that nobody else do. Okay, you're like, all right. I let the creativity, you know, do this thing. But you're going to have to put something out. Put a single out. The single's the way to go. Put it on TikTok. Test the so water. She said, so she was like, daddy, I'm going to staff them. You know, maybe the vibe will come back around. Because she really had a thing. Like four yeah. joints for fans. It's like a, uh, it was like an upbeat Afro R and B mix party vibe, you know, kind of like girls summer type thing. Okay, I all think the, that's what it was, and I think she felt like she missed the time because the summer yep. was coming to an the end. Girl summer thing was yeah, 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 yeah. It was cold. Yeah, so she was like, no, I'm, I'm gonna stash these away." And I'm like, I, mean, "I know one of the bank one. I, that's the one, that's what I was really mad about." Like. This one is gonna go. That's the single. You gotta you put need the to drop out. It. Yeah. But I respected her artistry. That's now right. she's working on something else. So that's what it is, man. That's right. Love on your kids, love on each other, man. Lucky Lucky Podcast. Left. Mike Denbrock. Notre Dame put out a video of Mike Denbrock coaching. And I want you to just kind of listen to what he talked about in this piece. And also, you know, what you pulled from. This is Mike Denbrock. Courtesy of Notre Dame on Twitter X. So, yo, that's a lot in there. That was about a minute and a half. But Mike Denbrock teaching his tight ends, that's his position. And also just the ability for him. See, he's, he's co coached every position on the offensive side of the ball, along with being a play caller, man, and an experienced play caller in different systems, in different ways of getting the job done, whether it's LSU, Cincinnati, Notre Dame. And you're starting to see the diversity, and we're going to get to Dylan McCullough and what he is bringing that or allowing his running back room to be a very positive influence 
in the offense being able to be opened up and the off and the offensive excitement from some of the players when they talk about the explosiveness in this Denbrock offense. But left just the way he teaches, like the tight ends running the skinny post or being thin. Like what stood out to you from that minute and a half from Mike Denbrock and him coaching the offense of the tight ends? What stands out is that he's a guy that cares about the, the small things. Mm. He talks about keeping your knees and your elbows in and, and building power. These are technique things that you need to keep in mind when executing this at a repetitive time, like a building your muscle memory. So Mike Denbrock is definitely not a guy that is going to make things complicated. He's going to harp on the little things that are going to stand out when you need to execute the play. And so to have that comfortability and, and repetition – and building muscle memory, that's what makes Denbrock really good at what he does when he works with position groups like tight ends. Obviously, we have a, a, a nice long history of great tight ends, but for him to be able to instill that, that groundwork, that foundation, he's a foundation guy. That's how you get development to happen because you get guys good at the little things and the techniques that end up showing off later on when they combine that with their natural talents the ability to make plays when they need to. And when you're in a position like that as a player, when you get the technique things down, it, it makes it a lot easier to let your, your your baller come out. And that's where that synergy comes from Mike Denbrock because then he's going to give you the ball. He's going to give you opportunities to, to make plays and it's going to come based off of your technique, but also your playmaking ability in the offense. For me, it is the excitement and the energy that he brings which was let me tell you something i i'll come out and say it now i've heard so many stories over the previous not last year but the years before that that the and i'm sure mike denbrock will get out of the cap so that's not what i'm saying you you can tell stories about mike denbrock getting out of after you in practice but the constant cursing and a big time, I would say this flat out. Their former OCs have had face to face confrontations with players about their language towards other players. And that's when I feel like you, you've crossed the line. You're crossing the line. When the players have to tell you, hey man, don't do don't do that. Don't do that. All right, we let it once, twice. I used to tell my coaches all the time. I never told them not to coach me. But my father always said, you let them know. Hey, you can get your point across without calling me out my name and cursing it. That's right. Whatever you need me to do, just say it once. I promise you I'll get it. I promise you I'll get it. For calling me out of my name and all that other stuff, nah. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just telling you you can't do it with me. Can't do it with me. Or, or you don't need to do it with me. Now, you can scream all of that, coach me hard. But I think I think every kid should have that ability to, to tell a coach, all right, man, this is my limit. That's right. This is my limit. Coach me as hard as you want to. But no, I, I don't agree with, no, just say what you want to say. I had to check my daughter's uh, cheer coach in competitive mm. cheer. I'm mm. like, I don't care. I don't care how you talk to the rest of these kids. I don't talk to her like that. And there's no one is more critical of her than me. me. That's right. You're not, yeah, you're not going to talk to her like that. No. Yeah, 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 let them know sometimes. Man. And I think the energy that Denbrock brings is a far departure. And I wasn't, Jared Parker really, Jared Parker didn't even, he, he you know that, that meme of Homer Simpson going back into the bushes? Coming yeah. out and like, oh, into that, the background. yeah, that was Jared Parker, dude. Like you yeah. really didn't even notice him at practice. You just did it. You did it. You didn't notice him at practice, man. Gino's so tall. That I noticed Gino more than I noticed anybody else in the office staff. Gino, Gino and D Gino. and Coach D. But Denbrock, like I said, yo, he was like the five Piper at Pro Day, bro. Mm. He walked in and it was like everybody, man, 
Everybody starts flocking to him. Yeah. He's just charismatic. So I'm glad that that energy, that new type of energy is in the building now. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a, a bigger respect and in, in, in different personalities are in there. You know, a guy like Jared Parker, like you said, the Homer Simpson fades to the bushes. I feel like Al Golden is, is, is sort of similar to that. He's not going to be necessarily the one to be the raw, raw rally guy, more on an individual level. He's going to talk to you about certain things. Dembrock's bringing that that freshness, that command. I think, if anything, you get a real captain of the ship feel, mm. of the Jack Sparrow of the situation, whereas we didn't have too much of that personality before. Not that it wasn't good or anything. It was just when you think of offense, you know it's Dembrock's offense. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just – follow in line and buy in, then Brock going to put you in the right spot. So that trust factor is something that we'll have on offense that we didn't have last year. Remember, Tyler Buckner was teaching everybody the offense last year. Tyler Buckner's putting people on and he leaves. So now we get a guy that's the coach in that position where he's like, okay, I can ease the waters. We're going to have a plan in place. We're going to work these techniques and we're going to be good on offense. And I think the guys noticed that and gravitated to it, but also it got better once the uh, things were halfway set and then they find out Denbrock was coming. Now you get your Chris Mitchell more excited, your Bo Collins more excited, uh, your Michael Gilbert's opportunities to show up in a, in a, in a situation like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's really good and refreshing to have. It. I know Marcus Freeman appreciates that. Marcus Freeman looks down there and be like, okay, they get, they, they handling it. They handling business over there. So, as long as we got that, we in a good spot. You mean uh, Coach Denbrock didn't come in and say he was running Jared Parker's offense? No, man. Yeah, he wasn't. You know, no, no, no. <laughs> he was in there talking the right stuff. He said, listen, we're going to run what we know is going to win and what we know is going to get to the top for sure. He ain't running no mic, dude. <laughs> you had to turn the page on that one. Left. Turn the page on that one because we turned the page on Jared Parker. You know, for him to be able to slide in like he did, we're going to be able to slide in like he did, then turn around and then get a head coaching job at Troy. I just thought that was like the mass bandit. I can't even, I can't even knock the hustle. I can't, I can't even knock, knock, I can't knock the hustle. He definitely hustled the heck out of the OC position at Notre Dame. Hustled it. Hustled it better than Tommy did, in my opinion. He definitely hustled it better than Tommy did. Yeah, he definitely. I mean, shoot. It, it was, I mean, it was a smooth transition. It was like one of those bank heists. You know, I mean, he, he made out like a smooth criminal coming there and do pretty solid. And then with the next, MJ Lean? Yeah, with the MJ like, Lean? Think about it. He wasn't expecting, he wasn't even on the list of guys being offered the position at first. And he just happens to step right in place and then said he's going to take a bunch of people's opinions and, and complaints and suggestions. Next Fast. thing you know, he had, I mean, that's, I mean, that's probably the fastest transition I've seen. I wonder what Troy saw. Mm. I don't know what they saw, man. Detroit usually is able to launch the careers of head coaches. They have a good history of getting head coaches in that do a good job at Troy. There's plenty of talent down there, down south. They get the kind of like the residue that falls through the cracks in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. And it's a really good program. I don't know what made them go after Jerry Parker, dude. I'm gonna be. I'll be honest. Maybe yeah, they felt I mean, one year was all you needed. <laughs> and he he probably interviewed really good. And you're not gonna have the same amount of talent to execute. So, I mean, hey, this is. I would say it's a shot in the dark. But hey, I mean, Troy is a pretty good program. They get some good turnouts. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, you might be calling one of their games. You never know. Never know. Next season, Dila McCullough met with the media and talked about the focus. What's the focus of your running back room? Uh, this off season, what are you what are you asking guys to do, Coach McCullough? The focus with all of them has been, you know, reaching their full potential, and specifically with those guys, I'm continuing to get them guys um, high volume reps, opportunities for them to show that they can be those lead guys, which I've seen that last year, you know, and, and carving out roles for them in different ways. We're going to get them the ball, um, you know, between well, all of them will have those opportunities, but obviously. Um, Jeremiah and, 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 and J.D. were the guys coming into the bowl game who took um, a fair amount 
uh, you know, followed by Jabron, who had, I think Jabron might have 18 plays in that game too. So just really excited about, you know, those upper three guys, but also just really excited also about the two young guys. The guys are going to be real good. I just want to start from the, how he ended. The man said, he's basically like putting you on notice. I got four. Yeah. I got four. I talked about the two that played the Trump Bowl. I'm talking about the two that just got here. And, heck, I still got Jabron, and I haven't mentioned him. We're gonna, yeah, and that, and that was the spring him. leader last year. <laughs> right. Jabron was the spring leader last year. He was the one that had the best spring last year. And, I mean, you know, that's the toughest thing that he said was that he's trying to get them all reps. He's trying to figure out what formula, what combination works the best, what plays go with who and who can execute the best in that group. I think all of them have uniquely different uh, uh, values to the running back room mm -hmm. and finding that that perfect uh, meld between speed, power, and versatility with those guys, it's a good interchangeable uh, a situation. I mean, you can put a Aeneas in for a Jeremiah Love, a, um, a Jabron in for a Jadarian, and 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 mix it up and match it up how you want to, which is the benefit of having great recruiting. Mm -hmm. Where usually you get, oh, this the one back, this two back, this three back. Right now, Dean is like, listen, maybe when it's raining, we go one way. Maybe when, you know, I woke up on the right side of the bed, we go another way. But either way, you can't lose. And with that, you you start to build a a, a room that supports each other. You know, a lot of these um, these rooms are competitive, but also a support factor because guys are going to get in. Some are going to get the ball more than others, and hopefully the hot hand stays. That's usually how it goes. But, you know, for me, I'm excited that we have options. And that's what Dean McCullough knows for sure. He's like, one thing's for certain, two things for sure. We can run that football. Facts. Or we're going to be able to run that football. Right? And a lot of people are worried about the offensive line. And I keep saying, look, man, it's Notre Dame, man. Eventually, the offensive line is going to show up. Offensive line has had to carry this program in big games for far too long. It's about time we got some wide receivers to help. About time we got a room full of quarterbacks that can help. Now, let's see how this young offensive line is able to grow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how is the offensive line, you know, coming along as as it, as it is when yeah. if you can just get us to the second level with these guys we got in the room? Oh man, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really good day because once they get a full head of steam with Jeremiah Love, once the Jadarian Price get a full head of steam, we saw it in the spring game. If Jeremiah Love can bend the corner, he has the second and third level gears. To, to take it to the house, not just get a first down. Whereas Aldrich may get the first down, get tackled, you know, a little bit down the field. Darian's getting untouched. Mm -hmm. If he just gets that, if he gets around, Jeremiah loves the same way, put him in space, have him go one-on-one -on -one with a secondary defender. I trust that he wins that more times than not. Dina McCullough also talked about the rotation and how these guys are getting repped in spring and how that might turn and transition into the fall in the regular season. Um, what well, a good thing about the way that we rotate the guys, everything that we're seeing now, it's not like, wow, I didn't see that before. We play, them, we play all those guys so much, so the, the issues that need to be addressed, we're addressing those right now. Um, and those are few and far in between, you know, or they wouldn't have played last year. But just the growth mentally, the growth knowing that, okay, I'm going to have a, a bigger role in the grand scheme of an opportunity to carry the team opportunity to highlight not only what they're about, what the room's about, and what the teachings are about, ultimately what the football program's about. So just excited for them guys. Jeremiah has shown, obviously, an explosiveness uh, on the fields. Uh, what makes him so dynamic? What's allowed him to, to be that type of player? Well, I think just his level of comfortability at this point. You know, he's, he's, he's been here. He knows, you know, although it's a new offense, you know, so he's, he's done a great job of integrating into what the new offense is, um, understanding what his role is. He put on seven to eight pounds worth of muscle. Um, so that's been big for him too. Now he's not only very fast and explosive, I mean, it's it's sturdy, it's, it got some girth to it. 
you know, so just excited about what he'll ultimately bring to the table, which should be pretty dynamic this season. Hey, I like what I'm hearing about Jay Love, boy. All he needed was a little bit more of a uh, meat on the bones, get a little bit bigger. But electric and dynamic is the two words that come to mind and something that we, I'm going to say, not that we're not used to, but it is something that we're excited to have on a consistent basis. I wouldn't say necessarily Audrey's electric and dynamic, but to have a guy that, you know, at some point if you give him the football, he can really make it happen and, and give mm-hmm. us that Kyron Williams type of uh, dynamic play. You know, they're both from St. Louis, so we tend to do well with these guys from St. Louis at running back. Yeah, I agree with that. Lucky Lucky podcast. So he also talked about, look, man, I'm here. Okay, don't worry about what you hear. I'm here. That was a double entendre. That's right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what my goal was coming here. You know, I mean, it, it, I mean, this chronicle. There's been a lot of opportunities to to leave for what would be considered lateral roles, or to me, a backwards role. Even if I'm going to the NFL, because I'm like, I've been in the NFL, I won a Super Bowl there already as a running back coach. So, um, being a, having an opportunity to be here in this type of environment with these type of players and coaches. And then obviously with the faith of the head coach to put me into that role, I want to make sure that I exhibit everything that needs to be exhibited in that role and continue to grow the program. Let's do one more for coach. And I guess, how does that, you know, how does, how do you, how does that help the running back? How does that help you guys as far as your leadership? Knowing, you know, that that's the potential, that's the goal, but you know, that you still have a job to do here. Yeah, well, they see it. I mean, those guys are exposed to some of the things that, you know, I've got to a point where I can show the whole team is just those leadership skills to make them better men on and off the field. You know, so, you know, running backs are immersed into it as far as the details and how we do things and how we want to, you know, just operate on the continu- on the continuously high level, obviously exhibiting being detailed, dependable and disciplined at all times and in all aspects of our life. You know, so um, they get an opportunity to see it you know, up close every day. But at the end of the day, we still want to go out there and do the things that take to win the game, and that's what we're going to do. Hey, he sounds like a coach that wants to coach running backs in Notre Dame for a nice little time. That's right. That's nice right. little minute. He definitely wants to build a legacy. I mean, he's recruiting like it. You know, you're not recruiting these guys that are stacking the room like you are if you're looking to leave. I mean, who does that? You want to cash out as long as you can. And, you know, the same follows for a guy like Mike Mickens. Mike Mickey's had a lot of opportunity to, I'm sure, bounce. Mm-hmm. But having that 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 room be stacked like it is and you see the the, the fruits of your labor uh, continue to blossom, I feel like it's hard to leave a situation like that on top of the fact of the stability that, that, that the program has at this juncture. Maybe this is year one. Maybe we'll see what happens. But this is year three of the program that's like, hey, if you come here, and you, and you do what you're supposed to do, you know, we can take care of you for a long time. And, you know, it's not too many guys that get tired of that, especially with the consistency being all over the place in college football today. Let me ask you a question, Lev. I think a lot of people, if I, if I ask who has done the better coaching job, I think a lot of people would kind of discredit Dylan McCullough because of, Notre Dame's history with running backs. And because of Notre Dame's history over the last decade or so, and what Mike Mickens has created from a deficit, per se, at the defensive back position, to whereas the defensive backs were okay, and now what the defensive backs have been and what the future looks like with Jaden Mickey and Christian Gray and others coming with Carson Hobbs, Leonard Moore, later on this fall, do you think from a perception standpoint, it looks like Mike Mickens is the top assistant? But if you take a step back and you really look at what Dylan McCullough has been able to do, even with Logan Diggs when he was here, all you estimate what he was able to put forth this year, and then the expectation of the running backs and the depth that he's had the last two years in that room, like Dylan McCullough's done a pretty darn good job, my brother. Like, Mick might be the top guy, but D- D-Mac's not too far behind, in my opinion. D-Mac's the one that's flying on the plane with Marcus Frank. So, 
you know, I don't know how you rank that hierarchy wise in the, in the in the staff, but if you find a plane with the head coach out taking pictures in front of playing like you and Bad Boys, Martin Lawrence and Will Smith, then I feel like that's your partner in crime on the road, and uh, it, you know it translates to the uh, to what it is. But I do think it's cool though that Marcus Freeman got these guys under the under the uh, under the wings, right? Mm-hmm. He got a Dina, he got a Mike Mickens to to lean on guys that are very dedicated not only in development but the recruiting aspect. You're getting a two for one for both of those guys because you know Al Gold may not be the strongest recruiter, but when you got a guy like Mike Mickens that can bring him in, but also develop him at a high level, you got a guy like Dina McCullough that the guys trust. The recruited, the guys on the recruiting trail trust Dina McCullough. Mm-hmm. Not dealing that with, but that's okay. He had prime time. But the, everybody else, they trust Dina McCullough. And they come in and they see the results. They see Aldrich. They see how you can have a lot of talent in the room and still be able to get production out of it. Still be able to keep guys happy. Still be able to spread the ball around and keep. The, the, the flow of things in the right position. And that's a hard thing to balance when you're selling the, yourself on the recruiting trail. You know, these guys are, I mean, Dean McCullough's putting in the work. He's like, look, I got this and that and this and that. And, you know, we're going to be great and, and helping guys understand that you don't need the ball 50 times a game. I mean, in today's age, that's, that's, that's the magic that he pulls off. And to mm-hmm. be able to stay consistent like that, and even tell a guy, hey, we we appreciate your running back, but try over there. And he stay. I mean, we we in a good position from these assistant coaches for sure. And like I can't even get a consensus if I say rank the top three assistant coaches on the set. I don't think we would get a consensus one through three. No. I think everybody would have someone different. In those positions, this is based upon your preference and your perception. That's really what it is. I mean, in the moment, most people would probably say Al Golden just coming off of last season, but you wouldn't have said that after the first season Mm-mm. that Al Golden was here because people had issues with a lot of things or took issue with some things, right? Mick, I would say, over two seasons has been consistent. In my opinion, with the way his guys have played on the back end. B Mac, like I said, he had the two-headed monster that was Logan Diggs, Aldrich Estimate. Diggs transfers, people are worried. Yeah. Aldrich Estimate has a monster season. And now we're talking about him having a five-headed monster at running back, which is crazy. And the passing game being impacted. Yeah, think about his his relationship with Jabron Payne, a guy that was started really hot on the year and then apparently mm-hmm. got in and and just keeping his mental together when you're watching Jeremiah Love uh, jump out there and you're seeing Aldrick be the the go to consistent back and you and he's thinking like, man, I was a spring first pick of the draft, MVP of the the team, and to get him to come back and have that trust factor with Dino McCullum shows that he's he's bigger than just a coach and recruiter. This is a guy that he's these these kids look to as an extension, probably of their own father, or, or in some sense, because you got to yeah. put a lot. These kids put a lot of faith in these coaches to guide their careers, to manage that sort of thing. And for a guy like Jabron Payne, who I know probably wants to get the ball every time, to accept and, and understand his role and his opportunity is going to come because he trusts Dina McCullough. I mean, that's what Marcus Freeman really wants to bring in. You know, it's bigger than just being able to fly around the world and, and recruit these kids. you got to establish a relationship. And those two, Mike Mickens and Dean McCullough, are probably the best relationship builders on the team because those rooms are going to respond uh, the right way. Just like I feel like Mike Brown is, is, is sort of putting his opportunities two cents in to try to cultivate that same uh, mentality and trust. And we'll see the response and how that blows up, right? So we can tell right now that if you're able to communicate well and and be on the same page like Dina McCullough and, and Mike and, and Mickens have been able to prove. I mean, those rooms speak for themselves, right? You got award winners, first round picks, you know, top top backs in the league from a numbers wise. The results, the results stand out. Yeah. But he definitely need to teach them how to block. <laughs> oh, 
That's a great <laughs> tease. <laughs> That's a great tease right there, Left. I see what you're doing. Lucky yeah, Lefty yeah, podcast. yeah. Got a block. <laughs> so that is a breakdown of Mike Denbrock, what he's brought, the energy he's brought in comparison to the previous two offensive coordinators. And then we talked about Dylan McCullough and his approach to the running back room this spring. I love the ability. So when we get to the other side, Left, I know you thought you always love having a bell cow in the running back room. One guy you can depend on. I know that's something you always say, yo, who's the guy? Who's the guy? But the strength of what this, the diversity and the depth of this running back room and what it can mean for Notre Dame in this new tempo, up-tempo offense of Mike Denbrock's, I want to know if you feel the same way, if you feel like, uh, man, with this transition, this might be beneficial for Notre Dame. We'll talk about it coming up next. That dude, the original lucky lefty, Sean Davis, will be right back. What's up, family? The merch shop is finally here. Lucky Lefty Network merch shop. We got it all. From the shirts to the hoodies to the hats to the nitty gritties. Come here right now. Shop with us. Come get the swag because you know, if anything else, we spin it different. You see the gritty. You see how we get down. It's elite. Lucky Lucky Podcast, Anora Whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. Hit us up. CFB Nation, Audio Edibles, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, subscribe, share, hit the like button, the thumbs up. We appreciate it. We respond to all your comments. We appreciate all your comments. Home in the Misguided Passion, Lucky Lucky Podcast, forever committed to making sure that we continue to spin it different. Continuing the conversation with the running back room and how this offense via the running back room is going to be more diverse, more explosive. And left before we get to the players, Jeremiah Love, Jadarian Price, and also uh, your guy, Aeneas Williams. How impactful is this running back room and the different talents going to be on this offense, this newly explosive offense being installed by Mike Denbrock? And I know you love the bell cap at the running back position. Are you sticking with that? Or would you like to see something different this year? Well, I would love to see from this running back room be more involved in the pass game and the intermediate game. I think for the quarterbacks that we have at this juncture, the, the running backs and the tight ends will be a great starting point. Mm -hmm. and focus early on in the season and then work your way outside the hashes and get to more of your receiver routes, especially when Steve or Kenny gets more comfortable uh, in being in those live rep situations. The running backs and being as dynamic as they are, we know they can run the football. But now can they pass protect, get into the, 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 the mismatch of the game and make it easy for their quarterbacks to get them the football in space? That way, you know, teams start to adjust to that and it'll it, bring in the running backs more into the fold of the passing game will help the passing game for our receivers on the outside, especially uh, in terms of making an impact in the game. So, yeah, we know we can run the football in, on a conventional level, but can we run it efficiently and be able to use that to open up the pass game? I think that's vitally important. And one of the things you talked about as you teased the second segment was, yo, these dudes have to pick up. And we saw that early in the season, right? Especially the first game against Navy. Like, yo, these dudes are struggling to pick up the blitz. Yeah. Same thing they struggled with in the second half versus Navy the previous year. And so it's like, man, what's going on? And one of the young men out of that running back room, he spoke about that immediately. And that is your guy, 2000. 24 running back freshman Aeneas Williams, his first spring, he talked about, hey, man, I'm just trying to get used to this pass pro. Absolutely. You know, uh, learning that pass protection is pretty, 
it happens quick. Uh, so just, you know, seeing them big blitzing linebackers off the edge and stuff like that, you know, you gotta, you gotta grow up quick, that's for sure. And that was one of the things Coach D mentioned to us. And he's like, yeah, to me and Keijan, he's like, y'all better be ready to grow up. It's gonna happen quick. And so, you know, just getting used to the speed of the game has been huge. How much have the older guys, obviously coach can tell you, but how much have the guys, Jeremiah, uh, JD, how much have they helped you, you know, kind of learn the scheduling and learn to the, the path protection as well? Yeah, so just as a young guy, I mean, you don't find, because obviously at the end of the day it's competition, but you don't find yourself, if I need to ask them a question, I know they're there for me. But like, I just find, I want to say I find myself more just following in their footsteps, because obviously, I mean, ones, twos, threes go. So I'm, I'm just watching them, I'm learning them, you know, especially there at the beginning. And now that we're, you know, starting to split things up, but just having them at the beginning, I have three uh, lead examples for, you know, how to do this the right way, the effort, the attention to details, you know, just having them to look up to and, you know, follow from has been huge. Yeah. Sure got Definitely my guy. Love the fact that he knows what it's going to take and what's important to play and get on the field is learning that pass, bro, and having the confidence. Like you said, that's, you know, you coming out of high school, you seeing Drake Bowen and Jay Nosberry running off the edge, and you got to step and take the blunt of that. I think it's definitely uh, an experience that you got to get comfortable with fast. Like Dino McCullough said, he can't. He can't prepare you for the physicality. You just got to be ready and, and step up to the plate when it comes. And, and if you do that, you're definitely in a, in a good position to uh, really be in a, in a spot. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, and I think it's really important uh, that they understand that it's not always about just running the football. You know, this is a, a running back room that's very versatile and special and unique in a lot of ways. And a lot of guys have different abilities that stand out. And the common denominator is blocking. You can get put some shoulder pads on another linebacker and help the team in that way. I think Aeneas is going to find his way faster on the field. But also, his ability to be such a dynamic running back, I think he's going to find a lot of benefit being able to learn from the guys ahead of him and have a faster start once he's able to get more reps. Man, I absolutely love what that youngster said. The fact that as a youngster, he's like, yo, this is my way to make an impression. Like, and he's like, honest. He's yeah. like, man, that, that, that blocking is different. <laughs> we, dude, we said this the other day. Like, dude, being the best player in high school on your team, it's a transition, man. It's only a small percentage of guys that are going to come in and be bright youngs and make the impact like that. Everybody else goes through the same process, man, right. of one to two springs before they really make an impact in a football program. And it's the fans that are messed up because we feel like we want it, like the microwave. Like, oh, he's yeah. here. He should make an impact. That doesn't happen for everybody. Like, eventually, one to two springs, if they're good, they'll start to see the field. They'll start to see it. But – this young man is telling you, hey, man, Whew. and he just got his opportunity because Kedron came down with a slight pull of the hamstring, and now Aeneas Williams is getting that opportunity for more reps. And like he said, something else he pointed out, you say this all the time. You said this mirage to fans where they're like, you know, you pull the young guys, you teach the young guys how to play. And Aeneas is like, these dudes ain't pulling me aside teaching me. I find myself following in their footsteps. I'm watching it. Yeah, you got to – yeah, it's one of those things you got to watch it and learn it. Like, the game is around you. Mm -hmm. You got to absorb the game by being observant and you got to listen. And, you know, the game's so not told, you know, so you got to be able to pick up on things. And I think once the, the room matures a little bit in age, you know, if Aldrick was in the room, I'm sure he would probably drop one or two gems on guys, you know. But this is a, a young man's sport. It's the training ground. This is the – the prove it year for a lot of guys in that room. So it's a little more on the uh, the edge of competitiveness than it is uh, camaraderie. But it's mm-hmm. but through the competitiveness, the camaraderie will, will show itself in the season and, and that support will 
uh, help each other once the, the the order comes gets right, and hopefully when the guys get caught ca- when guys catch fire, that support is going to show through uh, leading by example and, and being happy for guys in front of them. And these Williams is also getting a shot back there at punt return as well. Though. Hey, I'm telling you that man that man can do it all, and I'm, I'm glad to see his versatility being shown early. You know, give him some chances, kick his, kick the ball to him sometime. At least we don't have these uh these one off. Intermural players being back there. Jadarian Price was asked about Coach McCullough and his impact. This is what Jadarian Price had to say to the media. Well, yeah, you know when, when Coach does, when Coach Freeman does uh, head coach of the week, um, midway through the season, Coach Coach McCullough is a head coach, and you know he even tells the whole team that. And it's funny every time another player from another position group sees Coach, they're like D three, and you know, but it's. It's a good thing that not only the running back room follow, but anyone can follow. You know, it's a standard, um, and just it starts with being disciplined, and which is you know detailing everything. And you know, running backs might not it might seem like oh just run left, run right, block this guy, but no, there's there's more that goes into it. You know, there's landmarks, there's this amount of steps, this timing. You know, so just being detailed. That's what it starts with. What are you most excited for this season? Obviously, you, you injured year one, had a great season last year, now you step into this more prominent role. What are you most excited for? Um, I'm most excited to just be able to go out there and, you know, start the game off right and just, you know, a lot of a lot of the big plays that I made last year were like midway through the game or towards the end of the game, big plays. But uh, this year I'll get a chance to really um, make that spark for the game and for the offense. So I'm really excited about that. Once again, starting with the latter of his comments for him to say that because he he's like yo no i i want to be one of the guys that jumps it off and remember we've talked a long time left like we do if notre dame starts at two o'clock we can turn the game on at 2 30 because nothing's happening in the first 30 minutes offensively that's we've we've known that for years right we felt that for years right that dude the first quarter uh, we'll get to it. Jadarian Price and the offense even last year started to turn the corner a little bit in that area. Jadarian Price is like, yo, I don't want to make plays in the middle of the game. I want to start the game off making an impact and getting the offense going. And I love hearing that from the young man. You love hearing it because it shows the fact that he knows where he can make the impact in the game at. He probably watched last year and say, okay, I could probably get it, we could get it started a little hotter. I think the spring game, he only had a couple opportunities, and in those few opportunities, he saw that edge, took advantage, and, and, and saw the, the response from the crowd, your teammates, and, and felt good about being that guy that can can break the bank and take it uh, a run and take it the distance if he gets to the second, third level. And that's something that we needed to see. And you think about Ohio State last year when we played him, Trevion Henderson. That one play changed the mm-hmm. entire game because he mm-hmm. had that dynamic impact of just one time and the ability to take it 65 yards when he gets to the second, third level, nobody catching. That's Jadarion Price. And I think with that ability, it's going to complement so well with a guy like Jeremiah Love who's going to get you all those exciting yards. And then you got a guy that's a home run hitter and Jadarian Price, and he sees it. He's like, okay, this is where I can make an impact early. You, you don't want to change the channel in the first half. You're going to have to stick around pregame. You're going to have to do the opening credits. You're going to have to do that first kickoff because I might take it back in the kickoff. And then if I get a chance in open space, I can take it from a, a five-yard run make it a touchdown. So you got two home run hitters like that, the guy that's electric and the guy that can get you where you want to be. That's what you want to see. Looky Lefty Podcast. Continuing this, hey, our guy, Quill, from the Lou. Well, heck, your boy Aeneas Williams is from the Lou as well. You just, I, you must have an affinity for St. Louis court uh, running backs, left. Man, ever since Zeke, man, ever since <laughs> Zeke. Zeke, your Elliott K, Notre Dame. I knew he was special. I'm like, man, if St. Louis kids are different, you get a Kyron, then you get a Jeremiah Love, then you get Aeneas Williams. So we, we figured something out in that aspect. Yeah, maybe you guys shouldn't have recruited him as a linebacker. Cool as, a, as a corner. As a corner, right. My fault. I couldn't believe it. Like a corner? 
Yeah, you should go to Ohio State, man. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> well, shout out Coach Alfred. Hey, that's when he was holding down that running back in the recruiting world. Absolutely. Would you put Tony Alfred, if he's the standard as Notre Dame running back coaches? He's the he stand to Notre Dame for running backs, for sure. How close is McCullough to? McCullough's just a little different, man. We haven't seen that that staple guy. I mean, I guess you can call Aldrich the staple guy for Dino so far, but, yeah. uh, you know, I would love to see him put his – just like Marcus Freeman in the quarterback. Marcus Freeman, he's at a foundational quarterback he can ride on. Dean McCullough's the same way. Yeah, we got good players that come through – these years, but let us put a first round guy in. Let's put a guy in that's winning awards, something that we can can go out on the recruiting trail and be like, Yeah, I coach XYZ. Like Mike Biggins can do it. He probably toss around Sauce Garner every five minutes. Man, facts. <laughs> I know I would. I would name <laughs> drop like him. I mean, I would name <laughs> drop like crazy. And now he got Ben Morrissey. He can do that same thing with and Cam Hart. Yeah, I'm hard. He can do the same thing with uh Xavier Watts this year because he's coaching the safeties too. So mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, Mike Mickens is 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 got that that stamp of approval in 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 the world of football and Dean of and the color of him, uh and Marcus Freeman are looking for that same type of stamp. He stand has a stamp. He stand go like, oh, I got Zach Martin, Nick Martin, Ronnie and Q and da, 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 da. so he he's certified. And that's what you that's when you start attracting guys like Charles Jackson. He said, Look, I just want to come and watch film with the man. I don't need to be walking around all these academic buildings and dancing <laughs> on stage and all in your videos. Let me just watch film with him for two hours, then I'll decide if I commit or not. That's what you want to get down to. <laughs> you know. <laughs> man, they're trying to treat these coaches like they're not important, you know, but the coaches can make an incredible difference. I really think what has been assembled from a coaching staff, you're going to see the difference at important moments. Very important moments for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish in 2024. Once again, we go to your boy Jeremiah Love. He talks about his love for the offense that Mike Denbrock has going in spring ball. I guess it's a new offense, so having to learn it over is, you know, challenging in itself, but I wouldn't say there's anything necessarily tough about it. But the one thing I do like about his offense is that it's way more explosive. We're doing more stuff with the backs out and routes and stuff like that, and that's kind of my field of play, so I think the offense is great. And then you were working a little bit with the receivers when we were here this morning, I guess. Is that kind of building off of what you just mentioned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, I want to get some receiver work, like get a foundation on receiver. So that I could like, you know, move out the slide every time they need me to, um, stuff like that. I'm just probably be going like back and forth, slot, running back, that type of deal. He seems happier. I'm, I'm gonna keep it honest. Well, dude, what did we say all last year? Why do they keep running this dude inside? Why are they constantly running Jeremiah Love inside the tackles? Why? Get him outside in space. You're on mute, bro. They were forcing him to break all these tackles and and make it hard for him to use his ability. But now he's like, I'm playing a little slot. They throwing it to me out the backfield. This is more of my game. And he acknowledged the fact that, yeah, it's a little more complicated, but that means we're more involved. So that's Mm -hmm. not going to be an issue learning it because I know I'm getting it more. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you're definitely in a position where Jeremiah Love is, we talk about fit. Fit is the, the name of the game when you get to college football. And Denbrock, he, he understands the talent in that room. And Jeremiah Love is the perfect fit for the offense and where we're trying to go. Remember, I, I said our offense is throwing a lot of footballs behind the line of scrimmage. Throw it behind the line of scrimmage. Let those guys run them swing routes and uh, them out routes and them Texas routes. Put guys in position because the running back is the most open guy on any play, pass play. And the matchup is always great. Put Jeremiah Love running these linebackers out here in space. It's a lot harder to tackle him when we're just running them directly downhill between the tackles. And he's making guys miss in between the tackles. Now, just imagine he gets a guy in space. They're going to be like, okay, it's a lot harder to handle. So you get to see his route running ability. You get to see his electric mismatch ability. And also he can uh, take plays in open space and create bigger plays from – 
catching it five and below right now. These are, now we get to see that uh, little mix of what Kyron was special at when we split him out and had one-on-ones matchups. And, hell, he won the game in some instances doing that. So 21 personnel is something that you can see, especially with Jeremiah working with the wide receivers. How does that make Notre Dame more explosive and what opportunities can come from having Jadarian and Jeremiah on the field at the same time? Yeah, now you got that one-two combo. You get a little split back. You get some some opportunities to throw the defense off because now you're having mismatch problems in, in third down situations. Or if it's a four-minute situation, you have a big bigger back and a chair there in price that he can run between the tackles a little bit more, but also wear you down over the course of the game, which this is what the room is going to be consistent of. We got guys that you hit you in the first quarter, second quarter with Jeremiah Love, hit you in the second half with a Jadarian Price and a Jabron Payne, getting the uh, squeezing the clock out in a four minute drill, where I don't think we'll make the same mistake of putting the ball in the quarterback's hands in that situation. If we got a, a hot running back right now that's closed out the game, we're going to keep him in there. I think that's what Dean McCullough and Denbrock will recognize is that why are we going to take him out and throw a screen? That's not what we, it's not the strength of our offense right now. So, um, fit, I think fit is where everything is is coming together at. And, and I'm glad that we have Jeremiah Love at this juncture because that fit is going to stand out even more. And I really think my Denbrock is the perfect guy to come in to unleash what I feel like is a transition from powerful running backs with Logan Diggs and Audrey Estime to a new age of running backs in Notre Dame. Mm. I can't, I don't, I'm not talking about better. I don't know if there's been a more explosive running back room. Mm. I didn't say better. It's, yeah, you talk because we have depth. That's I'm what talking about, Jay. I'm talking about that one through sense. four. Explosive, explosive running backs, one through four. That's, please dig, dig deep. To let me know. Because, like, literally, on explosiveness, Jabron Payne might be four for fifth. Yep. And we already have one transfer over to the defensive side of the ball. <laughs> because the room is like that. It's like that. It's like that. So, man, that's crazy. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Love, he also spoke with the media about his focus, right? And how he forecasts this offense moving forward. Being grown from maybe, uh, you know, last season. Obviously, we saw some explosive moments from you, but where have you grown from there? I would say in my football IQ, um, you know, I, I came in, played as a freshman, got a lot of playing time, and uh, that only helped my IQ. You know, I know things that I didn't know before, and it allows me to be a, a smarter football player. And then how different does this feel now with Audrey gone and kind of a uh, wide open opportunity there for you? Um, I would say there's a lot more competition. Uh, you know, Audrey was Audrey. <laughs> we all knew what he was going to do. So um, with him gone, uh, there's an open spot. Uh, everybody's competing every day, just coming into work. And we're also being respectful about it. And nobody's hating on each other or nothing like that. It's just we come in every day and work and you know, play off of each other. I have a bit of, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question about Denbrock kind of wasn't relevant. Can you talk about, you know, the challenges or whatever it may be that um, just like about Denbrock's offense? Again? So Denbrock's offense is, I would say, is more explosive. Um, like I was saying, he's doing more stuff with the backs, you know, putting them out in wide, putting them out at the slot. And uh, that's the type of, that's my type of uh, play. And uh, I really like that about Denbrock. And shoot, like they got me running slot, running back. And that's kind of what we're looking to do going forward. Boy, that cat Jeremiah Love sounds like a dog that's been on a leash for about a year. Yeah, I mean, a, lot of guys, a lot of guys have been on the on the leash in the Notre Dame offense that has, has started thirsty to really mm -hmm. get put out there. This is, this is who let the dogs out season one under Marcus Freeman because now we're going to have to see this offensive talent that we've been recruiting and having under wraps for so long be blossomed, and, 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 and you get to see that on all levels. I mean, we might even see Jeremiah split out by himself sometimes just because we know that his ability 
is bigger than just handing the ball off. And Denbrock understands that. Uh, clearly, in the first couple of weeks of practice, the offense understands that. And you, everybody starts to buy in and say, okay, I know that I'm going to get my chance. They're going to recognize my talent and not just keep me confined to just doing one or two things. This room is very versatile, like we talked about, and it's going to stress defenses out because we're talking about running backs catching the football. We ain't even talking about receivers catching the football, the tight ends. We're talking about the running backs, the, the group that sustained us last year just running it. Now that's going to even change and be better than than uh, than what we expect. So I'm excited to see uh, what that looks like early on and how that, like we said, that's going to open up the receivers to be uh, a lot more uh, Im- impactful this year as opposed to being the, the the blocking dummies for the run game. Consistent motion, pre-snap, and then also running backs in the passing game. So now the Notre Dame offense has been easy, in my opinion, the game. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. I don't think there was any difficulty when it comes to game planning the Notre Dame offense. Like, if you just have to game plan the talent versus having to game plan the talent and the scheme. Yeah, we, we wasn't, the teams weren't game planning the scheme versus. No. Like, we just need to stop them from running the football and make them throw. Now they're going to be like, okay, we got to be careful because now they're going. if we try to do that, that man stuff on third down and just hunker down and try to just blitz the hell out of them, well, we don't want Jeremiah Love one-on-one. Because they might put him in the slot. We don't want a uh, 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 Chris Mitchell getting pressed on third down because they might throw it over our heads. So the threat is going to change the the defensive preparation week to week, and they're not just going to take the blueprint that's been out for us the last three four years of when in doubt, go one high safety cover down, and we're going to play and we're going to play to stop the run. Last year, we saw Notre Dame blow teams out that they're supposed to blow out. What is going to be 2024's bullet point that Malik wants to see to say, okay, offense is progressing. Last year was, you know, beat the teams you're supposed, supposed to beat by a wide margin. And start mm-hmm. early. What's the mm-hmm. next bullet point for the 2024 season? The next bullet point is to be exciting and electric in the first half. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have to come – and circle back, second half to catch the score and then watch the game. We should start fast. We had a little bit of that in, in Marcus Freeman's first year, coming out playing with more fire in the beginning. It's cooled off with some of the things that have taken place, but that's what we have to get on right now. We have to put teams away early so we can start working our, our young guys in, like Aeneas, and you know maybe even bring uh, in, in Jabron and get those guys more – more time because that's how you build longevity of a program when you can put a team away about third, fourth quarter, and then bring your twos and threes in to finish the game. So that's where we need to grow as an offense. We did a good job of uh, beating the teams we're supposed to beat. Now we need to dominate to where we're able to rotate guys and get them in the game, especially young ones. Lucky Lucky Podcast, fantastic show today, man, covering the running backs, the diversity of the running back room impacting the offense as Mike Denbrock installs his offense and hearing from the youngsters, Aeneas Williams, Jeremiah Love, Jadarian Price, and their feelings in the offense. When you hear Jeremiah Love flat out say, yo, this offense is more, man, Mike Denbrock's offense is more explosive. (laughs) He has been, you know, when you come home, you leave early for work and you come home and it's five o'clock and you hear, you hear your dog at the door, just waiting. Like, yo, I've been caged up in this house all day. Like, just let me out. Let me out. That is Jeremiah Love and Jadarian Price. Because Jadarian Price says, yo, I'm ready to make impact plays early in the game. Explosive plays early in the game. So you get excited about your running backs having that vision for what they can do for for this Notre Dame offense early and often. Which goes to your bullet point for the 2024 season. Super chat, I got Truman Dumel. He says, their player at camp who is really making a big impact who impressed you, Sean, and left. You want me to go first, left? Hey, right, look, I've been saying it, man. They put the video out, but I've been screaming Michael Gilbert from the first time I saw him. 
from the first time I saw him, and I thought Jaden Harrison was just a, a specialist kick return guy. Mm. And that dude, the way Ben Brock is using him in the slot. It's going to be real scary. Oh, and without a doubt. Chris Mitchell. Chris Mitchell off the bat. Off, I mean, off jump. Well, you know, I was going to say Chris Mitchell, but also for me, you know, I'm, I obviously want to see the quarterbacks. You know, I want to see Steve Angeli take hold of that. And, and, and you know, why not Kenny if, if, if all else fails? Why not throw Kenny in there and be able to hold it down? Because I think that the, the, the better and faster we get to playing younger guys and still having the same consistency on the offensive side of football, that, that spells great for having these first rounders that are known and not and not surprised by when the time when it comes time to getting drafted. I was surprised by Claypool, surprised by Miles Boykin, surprised by EQ offensively because the production wasn't quite the same. So for me, I do think it's is is really dope to see uh uh the offense potentially be the lead of the team. Man, who could have known? <laughs> who would have known that Marcus Freeman, a defensive coach, will cultivate an environment where that could be the possibility, Left, That absolutely could be the possibility. And I, for one, even with the return of defense that is slated to be top 10, I have no problems. No problem at all with the offense taking the lead. Lead us. Riley, Steve, Kenny, whoever. CJ, lead us. Let's go to the mountaintop, Lucky Lefty Podcast. Chat, as always, you guys have been fantastic. We have a get to the bag question left from my guy Strands. He says, why isn't Angeli being crowned already? Hoping it's not true. We need a difference maker at quarterback if Riley somehow doesn't play. You can take that one, left. It's not about the quarterback this year. It's not about the quarterback this year, I think. We should be expecting the team to look more dominant, more physically appealing, more physical out there. That's what's going to matter. Steve is the the most prepared at this juncture. That's why we're talking about Steve. I'm not talking about nobody that ain't even can't even get on the field yet, because we're talking about real life right now. The transfer news, hype, and excitement in the off season doesn't pertain, especially if you can't get on the field. So Steve is going to be able to, if anything, do his job. We just need the quarterback to do their job. Under Denbrock, if you can do your job, you're going to win it, be in a good position. Because like we we all said in this chat, we can win 10 games with or without Riley. Because we believe in the talent in the room. Come on, guys. This is like saying if we don't have Aldrich, how are we going to run the football next year? What do you mean? The room is talented at running back. We'll be able to run for sure, probably even better. And that's not knocking Aldrich. That just says that the talent we got, we're good with. We're not searching and choosing and, and waiting for somebody to come save us because that's not where we are as a program. Who do we need, Riley, to save us from this season? Who do we need? What team are we afraid of that we're like, oh, we need Riley Leonard to win us this game? I can't think of one because I think of our, our team and where we are and say, oh, Steve can beat a Northern Illinois. Steve can beat a Purdue, a Miami of Ohio. Hell, the challenge is the first game just to see what it's like, but I feel like he's confident enough to be good in that Texas A&M game because we're a better team than Texas A&M right now. So it's different. We're not asking Steve to come down and shoot a bunch of threes and Look like Steph Curry, but if we can say, Steve, you can get out on the transition and hit these layups, you can get the same amount of points <laughs> a lot easier. Just cherry pick a little bit for it. Just leak out a little bit. Let me throw it to you. Just run the lane for us. Yeah, we clear run the lane. lane. We'll set double screens for you because they're going to be so focused on, oh, we can't let that dude shoot over there. We got to get a handout so we can let Steve drive and get these two points, but we can't let these threes start raining off on us. That's all we ask Steve to do. So what is Riley going to bring us 
that is somehow so much more elevating than what we have. I can't figure it out. But see, that's the diversity of the talent and the strength that we've been speaking about. It plays into every quarterback in your room. Every quarterback in the room, everybody can drive this car. There's no, I'm not afraid to give this a Ferrari to any quarterback. I, no one's going to wreck this. No one's going to wreck this car. Somebody might be able to drive it a little bit better around the track at a faster time, but I have no fear that anybody's going to wreck this car. I don't, I can't say that the last two years. Can you say that? Can't say that. We saw last year the car was wrecked. In certain instances, the year before, car was wrecked. In certain instances, certain instances, I don't, I don't have that fear this year. No, I don't. It's just a certain confidence. We talk about the confidence that has been infused by Mike Denbrock. It's just a certain confidence that exists in that quarterback room. Certain level of talent that previously just wasn't there. This wasn't there. It wasn't there, man. I got Bootsy. Collins, 98 SD, do you think J.J. McCarthy really getting draft, is really getting drafted in the top five? I do. I do. I think that's a sucker born every moment. I do. Not top five, Sean. Yeah, I do. I do. Left, I top do. Five. I think so who's, four, so who's trading up? Four, four quarterbacks go in the top five. Four. Left, believe me when I tell you, four quarterbacks go in the top five. You taking that to Vegas? Would I take that to Vegas? Yeah. Well, I don't bet, period. I don't care. If, I don't <laughs> like, if I bet it, I would have bet it the over for Notre Dame wins last year. I would have run to Vegas immediately. Yeah. You know what I mean? Immediately. Give me the over. But, no, I don't, you know, but, I mean, if you want to talk about hypotheticals, yeah, I would bet it. I would bet it. I, that would be a nice prop bet. It's probably available too. That prop bet. How many quarterbacks get taken in the top five? Pretty safe bet. The four. Four. Who? Mm -hmm. uh, let me look at the draft. Let's do it. Let me look at the draft order so I can. How do you feel about this buzz coming off the pro day yesterday that Jaden Daniels should be the top pick? Well, I mean, you know, he's got the Heisman. I don't think he's – I mean, you know, the first round is such a interesting thing because it's about who likes you the most, mm -hmm. and it's not always about the best. It's just who – what team is bought in on you the most. And all these quarterbacks, Caleb, Jaden, Drake, May, uh, Michael – they haven't talked about Michael Penix much, but Michael Penix I think is in there from a talent standpoint, Bo Nix. Mm -hmm. I think all these guys are – it's just about fit and what team likes the fit of each of these quarterbacks. You know, I think all of them can play, obviously. But now in the first round, you're talking about picking apples and oranges. Is I think it's just a preference. So, if, you know, Chicago has a preference for one or the other. I think they have a preference for Caleb. Is Caleb and Jaden Daniels' talent that much different? No. And so it's, it's, <laughs> it's whatever the flavor of the week is, it seems like. And that's why I think they're trying to do all these interviews and uh, get down to the nitty gritty because it is splitting hairs with the talent amongst the group because they're all pretty good if you if you cultivate that right. Mm -hmm. So you asked me, in my opinion, looking at the draft picks right now, the <clears throat> the top three teams, in my opinion, take quarterbacks. I think Chicago, Washington, New England take quarterbacks. Mm. New England is a possible trade, but that will be somebody coming up to get a quarterback. Arizona doesn't need a quarterback, but Arizona has a second first round pick. So it would make sense for them as well to fall back. If they can fall back and still land one of the top three wide receivers, Arizona has to feel good about that and also picking up picks. Yeah. Yeah. So they have two firsts. Maybe they pick up another second, another third. To improve their team. The Chargers, they don't need, I mean, if they stay there and they want to take their top tackle, they can, but they can move back. They can move and back. And get one of the tackles. So you can have a team moving up to five. So that's four and five. And three, you literally can have teams coming up 
to get quarterbacks in those slots. We know one and two are quarterbacks. Chicago yeah. and Washington are taking quarterbacks. Three through five, literally two of the three picks could probably be trades to come up and be quarterbacks. So, yeah, I, I have no problem saying four of the top five will be quarterbacks in the draft. And for me, make, you know what makes sense to me? If I was Minnesota, who has two first-round picks, I'm doing whatever I can to go get Jaden Daniels. Yeah. If I found out for sure that the Bears are taking Caleb Williams, if you put Jaden Daniels with George Addison and Justin Jefferson, the Bears would be the worst team in the division. Mm. I'll say it right now. Mm. I'll say it right now. I'll say it right now. Who would you rather have, Keenan Allen and, and, and DJ Moore or Addison and Justin Jefferson as a, as a wide receiver combination? Man, can't go wrong either one, I'll tell you that. You can't go wrong, can't go but wrong. I would much rather take the two young cats. If you can pull that off. If the Minnesota Vikings can pull off, Getting Jaden Daniels and can plug him in because you see JJ McCarthy. Oh, he has to sit for a year. All right. You really think Justin Jefferson wants to wait for a quarterback for a year? Mm. They go get Jaden Daniels with the play calling of O'Connell. Mm. And Brian Flores calling that defense. Yeah, okay. Everything the Bears has done have done. All of, all of a sudden, you still could end up being on even par with the Minnesota Vikings. That division is going to increase in talent, that's for sure. Man. Jordan Love, Jared Goff, and then whoever goes to the Vikings and the Bears is going to be something to, something to watch for sure. Man, so – Yes, someone is going to be thirsty and go get J.J. McCarthy. I fully believe that. Fully believe that. I don't know, man. I don't know if they can let that happen. <laughs> Not J.J. McCarthy, dude. I do. I understand what you're saying. I, look, I promise you I understand what you're saying. God, I understand yeah. what you're saying. I know, man. It's a reach, but hey, they reach. remember, remember, <laughs> hey, remember, just, this is, this is funny. This is funny. Remember who they said the best quarterback in last year's draft was? It wasn't Bryce Young. It was a few people that said CJ, CJ Stroud. You know that dude down in Tennessee? He was supposed oh, to blow. They didn't, he say, to... they didn't say he was the best, though. Oh, yes, they did. Oh, Mel yeah, Piper. I, I, I Mel Piper, Mel did. Piper was like, he's yeah. the best. He's the best. He's the best of the class. It's not even close. Okay. Right. Well, that's, it, oh, the man. same that's, buzz you hear about JJ McCarthy. That's disingenuous, guys. No, I don't think JJ is a product. I mean, yes, and yeah, heck yeah. And I don't think that's a disrespectful thing. Yes, JJ McCarthy is a product of Jim Harbaugh because Jim Harbaugh has shown he can coach the quarterback position yeah. wherever he's gone. He can evaluate the quarterback position. He can recruit the quarterback position, and he can coach it. You're darn right he's a product of Jim Harbaugh. and nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. That's like you had Patrick Mahomes. Is he a product of Andy Reid? I'm sure he would tell you. You're darn right I am. Look at the list of quarterbacks he's put. <laughs> he's developed in the league. Yeah, ain't nothing wrong. With, what's wrong with that? Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I don't know why y'all argue with Roosevelt, dude. That dude, he's a he's a brick wall every time. Twelve and thirteen, my dude. Twelve and thirteen. That's all it is. Five and one against Notre Dame in the last six matchups. You want to go ahead and gloat over the Brandon Winbush game down there? Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Sure. More national championships, more Hall of Famers, more players over the history. Drafted into the NFL, dude. That man, come on, man. Your bars are weak. They don't. Your bars they don't, are weak. They don't want to do that. 
Yeah, yeah, right now, Roosevelt, whatever you come up with is like draped on the stage on Sunday night after Kendrick hit him with the haymaker. But it wasn't a haymaker, though, because... Uh, not the, stop, left, left. It's been a it week. Wasn't a it left, wasn't a direct... Left, we coming, we coming up. Where's the response, left? I'm still looking for the response. He's not going to respond because Kendrick didn't... Ju- I'm, I'm he, where's the first shot at? Because they left. both sneak this each other. Left. I I'm need looking for you to drop left. that Drake this, not no feature or nobody song. That's left. cute. Left. You need to say, left. Drake, I'm at your head. Left. Drop the whole song. Left. Where like Drake not left. about to respond to a, a feature line. He's on the clock. He's, He's on not the clock. responding to no feature. He, like, he didn't respond to push a T. The second time he got hit, didn't respond. Second time in a row. Second time in a row. We heard, oh, he had a verse. He had a verse. They wouldn't let me release it. I don't want to hear that. We should tease me a whole hit. song, no. Kendrick didn't left. make no song. Left. You keep avoiding the I agree with point. you on Pusha T. He, he didn't respond. That's he all I'm saying. He didn't respond to Pusha T. All Pusha I'm saying. T gave him a direct head shot. Kendrick, Kendrick playing on these features. What's it's the like, response? Man, hey, you going to tell me Drake gonna re- go, Drake's going to drop a whole diss song to a feature? I need it's a not response. even the same. I need a response. Drake's going to respond in a little sneak dissing way like he does all the time. Yeah. With t- until until they that's drop what team. Song. That's what Team Light Skin does. That's what J. Cole and Drake do. That's what they do. He's going to say little subliminals. But until Kendrick come out and drop that, Drake, I'm at your head. You, you ain't nothing. Then Drake will respond, but Drake ain't responding. To nobody doing no feature now. Come on now, he ain't, he ain't he ain't that he ain't that down bad for the beef, right? He ain't that thirsty for the beef, right? But I, but if Kendrick does drop that Drake complete headshot, this Drake's mm-hmm. gonna respond because he responded every time. Mm-hmm. He just not thirsty for the beef right now. Yeah, we're still waiting for the Adonis response, dog. I mean, he ain't, he ain't responded that. Push the T one. He don't he don't want the smoke. He don't want he doesn't want the smoke. He does want to smoke, but he, no, I guess. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Because he let other people talk him out of, of the... Who would... T- if somebody did something like that to you, would you let people talk you out of responding? If somebody came at your head, left the competitor you are. Drake let, still... Disappeared. Okay, he let me put it Let me put it in your format. I'm going to take you back to 2015. And let's say in 2015, you never got injured. And the week before the Clemson game, that cat Deshaun Watson stepped to the mic and said, that cat Malik, y'all keep talking about this dude Malik Zaire. Don't even worry about that dude. Y'all going to see who the best quarterback is on Saturday night. We already. But well, no, 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 no. I said, we play him on the moon. We play him on the sand. We play him their place. Our plays, it don't oh, matter. So okay. I, sent, I sent the first shot. So I'm cool <laughs> if, he, if he responds because I'm, I'm already on his head. But. You know, Kendrick dissing on the feature, and they and it didn't even <laughs> the beat was cleared without them playing Kendrick's verse. So they they being real slick over in Metro's camp, man. They being real. So slick. the Mike Jack, the Mike Jack, the Mike Jack line wasn't about Drake. It's a feature. Yeah, it was it's subliminal to Drake. But no, no, that wasn't subliminal. That wasn't subliminal at all. That was direct. He said Prince outlived Mike Jack. So yeah, yeah. that's that's subliminal because people don't know that Kendrick performed with Prince when he was alive and all that. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they do. Stop. 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 Stop trying to get your boy out. Stop trying to build exit ramps for your boy. I'm just saying. No, man. there are no exit ramps. He in hip hop, bro. He will be this right here. To respond to a feature. I he he has to do better than sitting up there saying what he said on stage. That was trash. That was trash. Did he lie? Yes, he lied. Man, yes, he lied. As yeah. long as he's not responding, you can't say that. You got bit bop by pushing the T, said nothing. 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 He so nothing. He, he, you know, he's just gonna he's gonna go and make house records. That's what he's gonna do. I'm not responding to a uh a feature. And okay. if he dropped a whole three minute song on Drake, absolutely Drake needs to respond tomorrow. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He would. He wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. He ain't got it in him. You know what time it is. Petticoat. 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 
It's time to get petty. Oh, we did a good job executing. Are you upset with something? And fire up the Petticoat Junction train. I just don't like you. You don't? No. What is today's petty historic Petty Junction? Petty Junction, Petty Story today brought to you by Nora Whiskey at norawhiskey.com, that premium American whiskey at norawhiskey.com. It's a little breaking news. Uh, Anthony Sack, four-star, five-star upside linebacker, son of former Penn State quarterback Tony Sack, mm. is announcing his decision on Saturday. He is going to commit his top five are Alabama, Ohio State, Duke, Wisconsin, and Notre Dame. And Al Golden, remember, was a teammate of Tony Saka at Penn State, which gave Notre Dame a great inroad to this four-star recruit. So Ooh. he has recently been crystal ball on other platforms to Notre Dame. And then the news comes out that he's setting his commitment date or announcing his commitment on Saturday. Let me tell you something, bro. I try to tell people, boy, this, this 25 class, the 26th class, but Notre Dame, if Notre Dame wins this year, watch out. Yeah, all we need to do is just win to solidify that, that pipeline. Now, I'm not even saying win a national championship. I'm just talking about playoffs, run in the playoffs. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. I have something, man. Oh, man. Man. Can I break this down to you? Yeah. Ohio State, Notre Dame. The fact that they got Penn State is up out, out of there. And Penn State was the team I was worried about early. His dad played there. He grew up around the program. I'm like, yo, Pennsylvania. So I still don't believe in James Franklin. <laughs> Man, facts. And don't, don't trip. Penn State is still putting in work at the linebacker position. Absolutely. They got a couple of linebackers going to the league in this draft. Michael Parsons, that, that legacy is still strong. Ohio State, Notre Dame. Ohio yeah. State, Notre Dame. It comes down to that. And things it's tend to be best, trending. The two best offers you can have right now in college football are Ohio State, Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. The two best. But early, I definitely thought Penn State was the team to beat. Draymond Green. Come on, man. All aboard. Man, look. When I see Steph Curry get frustrated the way he got frustrated last night with you, my brother, what what is wrong, man? Was KD wrong when he said you got some issues, my brother? Whatever demons, look, man, and I mean it was all sincerity, man. Whatever's going on with the with the brother, I hope everything I mean, comes back together. What's, what's wrong with him, man? He just he just. He's in he, character mode, you know. Like this is a character for him. Man, look, he, he's the tough guy on the team. You know what I mean? He's just a tough guy. That's no, he's not. Not. no, he's not. No, he's <laughs> not. No, he's not. No, he's not. You're not giving him the tough guy. No. no, because you knocked out some college kids back in the day at Michigan State. Who, who is he really? Who is he pushed around? In the NBA, name me a big dude that you saw him have. Rudy Gobert. Yeah, that was that was gonna. Yeah, that was gonna be my. <laughs> he hit Nurkic. I'm still waiting for another dude. He wouldn't mess. You would. He if he was to have a Charles Oakley in the league, he ain't, he's not messing with that dude. He's not. Do you remember the youngster? Matter of fact, remember the youngster that LeBron accidentally. Isaiah Stewart. Yeah, Isaiah Stewart went after him. He, he walked away. It's footage. Isaiah Stewart said something to Draymond. Draymond turned around and walked away. He it's want, entertainment, he, man. It's entertainment. He, he didn't want that smoke. He didn't want that smoke, man. He, Draymond is too. He's an entertainer. He's one of the biggest. That's why he has a podcast in the middle of the season. Middle Draymond season. is an, in a, he's an entertainer, man. He's a flat-out entertainer. Stephen A's on the petty train for me. Go ahead. 
talking about how LeBron teamed up with JJ because JJ going to say all the bad stuff LeBron don't want to say. And I'm like, come on, Stephen A. Come on, Stephen A. He's like, he's smart for teaming up with JJ, but it's not going to save you, LeBron, from criticism. Cause JJ going to No, it's home. not. It's not. Whatever you going to do, he going he gonna to glaze you up whenever you need to. But if he missing them free throws, he's still going to talk about it. I'm like, you hating Stephen A. Let the man do the podcast with JJ. They going to talk basketball. Come on, man. <laughs> man, Paul's on the glaze him up, though. Oh, man. Hey, speaking of that, Cal Brent, NFL Network, went on this tirade for five minutes, mm. protecting Caleb Williams. Mm. See, this conversation isn't about where you fall on this conversation left, right? I don't even care. I don't care. When he painted what he said about Notre Dame on his fingernails, I told fans that. Then, I don't care about that dude. Expertive ND on his nails? Well, I do. I care more about the fact that Notre Dame can't tackle this dude. I don't do. Beat this dude. I don't care what he got on his neck, what he has on his neck. Beat him. That's all I care about. Beat him. And I didn't care what he had painted on his nails when we smacked him up in South Bend this year. Mm. This is my problem with what Cal Frank said. Maybe he doesn't have a group of friends. Cal Brent, let me scoop you something. See, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. That's right. And to, and to this day, if I paint my nails pink right now and my boys saw me on TV, they going to light me up. Oh, for sure. It's a problem. They're going to light me up. But this is the key. I know they're going to light me up. See, Caleb Williams knows what he's doing. He knew going to that game, the cameras were going to be on him. He knew painting his nails pink was going to go put him in the news. He knew having a pink phone was going to put him in the news. He knew this. What are you sitting up? Why are you coming at the fans or coming at men that feel a different way or move a different way as if they shouldn't have thought? Maybe you don't have friends that question you. Maybe you don't have a friendship group that tells you, bro, that ain't it. That ain't it. That ain't it. That ain't the move. And if, the, if that's the case, then that's fine. I'm sorry. You need some better friends. That's it. I tell my friends all the time, you see me go up in the hotel room, I need you to kick the door down and come get me. Don't cover the door. <laughs> I don't need you to cover the door. That's right. Don't cover the door. Dog. Don't cover the door. Come get me. Snatch don't me make, out the yeah, room. Don't make it a compound mistake for me, dog. Absolutely. Me so, man, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Like you protect people talking about he might drop everybody. No, he didn't. What are you talking about? And everybody is talking about he might drop your captain because you wouldn't do that. What he did, you wouldn't do that on national TV. I don't care what he does. All I want the young man to do is win. And throw for 4,000 yards as a quarterback for the Chicago Bears. That's all I'm asking for. If he can walk out there and do it in a kilt like Roddy Roddy Piper, I'm cool with it. Make him a kilt. If that's how he wants to play, make him one as long as he produces. But he has to deal with the ridicule that he knows is coming. He knows what's coming. He knew it was coming when he showed up at the game. He knew it. You're the number one pick. You're the number one pick in the NFL draft. Going to the, the see Juju Watkins play. You know it's a national game. You know the cameras are gonna be on you. You already knew the ridicule. You knew it. I don't know about that one, man. I can't. Yeah, I mean, you know, the brother gonna express himself how he expresses himself, I guess, but man. And I and left. I don't care, bro. I don't care. As a fan, I don't care. Would I prefer my quarterback to look a certain way? Yes. Hey, it's look. Can I can I keep can I keep it all the way hundred? In two thousand twenty four, it's Bears fans that would prefer their quarterback not look like Caleb Williams. Let's keep it. Oh, above. that's been that's been you know absolutely. That's been that's and been it's not a small percent percentage of fans. No, 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 no. 
It's a pretty good contingent of Bears fans still in 2024 that prefer their quarterback look like Mitchell Trubisky. Agreed. Rather than yeah, 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 yeah. We know so that. Look, everybody has preferences. But at the end of the day, if that dude is winning games, nobody. So what are we talking about? I would prefer that you wouldn't curse or put curse words on your nails. I wouldn't do it. But I don't care if he did yeah. do it. And him and all Jerry I wanted was for Notre Dame to beat USC. That's it. Yeah. Beat USC. That's it. You know, I mean, you know, these these kids got these marketing and uh these uh marketing schemes and and these uh gimmicks. They be running these gimmicks like these rappers these days, man. They start painting the nails, doing the chandelier earrings, doing the different color hair. During our time, it was when dudes blonde, getting the hair blonde and all that crazy. So these these rapper gimmicks that these players are pulling off is just showing you how, you know, these uh, gimmicks are running ruining sports, man. It's, it's just it's clownery, man. It's clownery. Everybody giving this dude Cal Brent like love because he did like he did something. He didn't do anything, man. You definitely didn't do nothing. You got on national TV and, and cap for five minutes. That's what you did. Because you know darn well, I'm willing to bet that your boys would clown the hell out of you if you walked up in the spot the way Kata Williams did. Or if they saw you on national TV on Good Morning Football looking like Kayla Williams did. The heck out of here. Hey, I'm, I'm cool with anybody. Yo, you can sit on the left side of the fence or the right side of the fence on whether or not you feel like you should have done whatever. I tell people all the time, don't judge people by one instance or one time in life, especially young people when they have time to grow and mature. But we're not about to sit here and act like he didn't know what he was doing. Stop. We're not going to sit here and act like he didn't know that he was going to get clowned. He is about to be drafted to the city of Chicago, ladies and gentlemen. Chicago is not L.A. That stuff might ride in L.A. Not up here. Yeah, it's too cold for some of that. No. <laughs> no, he's going to have a problem. And we can talk about his 2024 and all this stuff. He's going to have a problem. I know the Chicago Bears fan base. He's going to have a problem. And something else he said in there. He was like, the coach of the Bears in 2024 is not Bill Parcells. I would prefer to have Bill Parcells at his age than Matt Eberflus right now. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. If you want to call him a caveman and all that stuff. He know how to win football games. Man, win football games. That's what it's about. Coach. Lead. Matt Eberflus has not shown me he can do that. He also said the locker room in the NFL is different now. Are you? He's going to get clowned. Let that dude walk in that Bears locker room with some lip gloss on and some pink nails. Oh, he ain't doing the lip gloss, is he? Hey, let him do that. I wouldn't. I understand that there are certain things that people have become open. Man, look, that his boys in that locker room are going to clown him. Yeah, they're going to clown his ass for sure. I guarantee you. That Equinemius is going to clown that dude. He come in there with a pink phone case and fingernails, and this is not me supporting anything. I'm just telling you the culture of the locker room. He's going to catch some strikes. He's going to catch some direct jokes. That's not to say that they will like him or will not like him. But, oh, yeah, he's going to he, – man. That's a necessary he's gonna, attention. He's going to catch these jokes. You can believe that. Yeah. You can believe that. Well, you just don't want to start off on the wrong foot. Ladies man. and gentlemen, Spice Adams works directly for the Bears Network. You think Spice Adams? The only reason he might not crack a joke is because he literally works for the Bears. <laughs> yeah. That's true. But I, but I guarantee you, if we were sitting in Spice Adams' crib, he had, I guarantee you, he has plenty of jokes. Plenty. So we need to relax, man. Dude, that, 
You don't have to protect somebody that knows exactly what they're doing. And they're doing exactly what they want to do. Caleb Williams knows what he's doing. He knows what he's trying to set up. His team, they know the image they want to portray. They're not dumb. If you agree with it, cool. If you don't agree with it, fine. But that's not going on these rants like he needs protecting. Protecting from whom? Himself? He knows exactly what he's doing. I hope so, man. Man. Dude, it don't do. He has to win. Look, I just told you. Over under is eight and a half, bro. They won seven games last year. Hurt Cousins and Justin Jefferson out. The Miami Minnesota Vikings won seven games. Is that amount of games? Don't let the Vikings get a confident quarterback. That's all I'm telling you. That's all. That's Vikings all get confident quarterback play. The Bears are in trouble. Bears in trouble. They're in trouble, bro. Because Keenan Allen only has one or two years left. Maybe two. They're in trouble, bro. But that offensive line is still mid. Still. Nah, Jason, everybody. I won't be wearing pink. I don't care if they win the Super Bowl two years in a row. I'm still not wearing pink. I'm not doing it. But I guarantee you, if Caleb Williams wins, or if he comes in and has a good season, he's setting up a lot of opportunities. That dude knows what he's doing, love. His team, they know. He's doing exactly what they want to do. <laughs> Great show, love. Man. <laughs> hey man, weird out here, man. I'm telling you. Hey man, I weird. I don't, man, look, all I'm saying is the young man knew exactly what he was doing. You're not about to sit up here and rant. Like you dropped the mic. You didn't. He wanted this outrage. He wanted this conversation. He wanted this talk. He's not stupid. He did it for a reason. Yeah. So now when the talk comes, don't act like you have to protect them. That's like your boy starting a fight in a basement party. And then all of a sudden, you have to. No, dude. Hey, look, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go. You do. I'm not doing this. I'm not, I don't have a problem with that person. That's a fact. Dude starts the, starts the Twitter fight, and then cats feel like they got to come protect him. We'll see y'all tomorrow. Another edition. Lucky Lucky Podcast.